Greetings, best of Trekkers! While well, Star Trek's bread and butter lies in its more than 800 episodes of television, it has 13 movies over the last 45 years. Let's be honest, many of them have been straight-up cash grabs, and some have started out with noble intentions and fallen on their face. My family and I sat down, watched all the Trek movies, and this video lays out an average of our three combined rankings. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Dustin Wing. Destroying the hero ship because at number 13, action for the sake of action or beyond. Yes, the most recent Star Trek movie from 2016 is the franchise's worst. When we started these rankings, I didn't think anything could be worse than a movie that takes almost an hour to leave space dock and is one of the slowest paced movies I've ever seen. Well, swinging all the way in the other direction turns out to be even worse. This movie might as well have been directed by Michael Bay cause it's not so much a sci-fi movie, but an action movie and with no other reason to have the action than explosions rule. The Enterprise gets wrecked in the third movie of a series seemingly only because it was destroyed in the original third movie, even though it's not for a good reason like resurrecting Spock. And if once wasn't enough, we get to watch what's left of the saucer section get destroyed again. The first time I rented this movie, I only got as far as tearing up the 1701 and I couldn't anymore. A few years later, I bought it on a good sale just to complete my movie collection, and watching it wasn't so bad. But upon our recent watch, I don't get it. The villain's reasons for being a villain don't really connect for me. The bad guys speak in a very slow, annoying way. It's not really explained why most of the Enterprise crew, except Kirk, Sulu, Chekhov, and Ensign Rando, are taken. Honestly, the only interesting thing about this whole movie is finding out Sulu is gay and Demora is adopted. Though the only character worth watching for more than a scene is the newly introduced Jala. And Jala's favorite public enemy song was a nice touch. But you can't hang two plus hours of movie on a couple of interesting footnotes. And just because we end with the building of the Enterprise A, does not mean we should get another Kelvin Timeline movie. Falling asleep at number 12, effects for the sake of effects, or the motion picture, the movie that revitalized the franchise and maybe the only reason we still have Trek today, is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. It was the first Trek movie I saw on TV as a kid, and I remember wondering what I had just watched after finishing it. It was nothing like the TNG I loved, or even the few TOS episodes I'd seen. It was a mess that tried to push the boundaries of 70 special effects, and that's all one can say about it almost 50 years later. While in the 90s and now I found these effects underwhelming, they were a big deal for the time. Though, so was Tron, and I already liked that movie by then. The recent 4K director's cut did make some welcome improvements and additions, that actually do help the movie be less annoying, but still don't do anything for the dragged out, motionless picture of a plot. Spock's need to mind meld with a space butt Gina is where this goes from boring to actively terrible. And this also contains Starfleet's worst uniforms ever. Climbing a rock at number 11. Pain makes the man. Or the final frontier. Here's another pretty universally agreed upon stinker of a Trek movie. Though it does actually have something worth watching in between Space Jesus starting a cult, cats with three boobs playing pool, and that is some of the best bonding between the big three. While the marshmallows in the woods are only okay, the exploration of Spock and McCoy's pain was some really nice backstory and even Kirk sidestepping the backstory moment by just stating he needs his pain are wonderful, important moments in the wider arc of these three characters. That being said, the rest of the cast takes a TOS episode-level backseat, even if Uhura gets to go a little risque. 
Outside of that, the movie doesn't even feel like a Trek film in its intro of a random hooded man riding through the desert on a horse with no name. The ending does feel decidedly Trek, though, with the godlike entity, though not to test humanity, but to try and trick them into performing its will, and it's in no way satisfying as most of the other meetings with higher beings. And to this day leaves us with a very important question. What does God need with a starship? Though the most important message of the film, if you pack it in, pack it out. Making very little sense at number 10, the search for more money. Or insurrection. I remember seeing this in theaters in middle school and asking my Trek friend that I went with what we just watched. Neither of us had a good answer to try and defend this. And it has not aged any better or grown on me, even though in recent years I've gained an appreciation for characters played by F. Murray Abraham. Unfortunately, Ruafo is neither well-written nor one of his best performances. Somehow, the Federation is more interested in gaining a group of a couple of hundred people at most as an ally during the Dominion War over eminent domaining this entire planet that has some kind of fountain of youth in its rings. Picard having a love interest this late in the game and having it not being Beverly, or Darren, or Lavoie, wears thin and feels hollow, despite the moment of clarity or whatever that he experiences when he's with her. And Riker playing Microsoft Flight Simulator, nor Data making a boob joke, help this movie in any way. Running out of money and leaving the climax as a blue screen background doesn't gain any points. Though the CGI in the movie is so noticeable and plasticky, maybe we were actually saved from something worse. There's probably more filler in this movie than any other in the Trek franchise. Many call this an extended TNG episode, and doesn't work as a feature film, which I largely agree with, but the real problem is, it feels like a bad season 2 or 3 TNG episode, and the trailer is every bit as bad as the movie itself, doing terrible recasting at number 9, unnecessary retelling, or Into Darkness. The story of Khan is not one that ever needed to be retold. And I'm not sure if there's an actor today that could ever match the performance or amazing chest of Ricardo Montalban, least of which was Eggs Benedict Cucumber Snatch. For a movie that many people put straight on the bottom of their list actually has an okay plot, which gained it a few ranks here, but it's executed on a poor level by seemingly no one that understands anything about Trek. It pathetic aesthetically tries to retell The Wrath of Khan, with a few key changes like Spock being the one to scream the classic Khan, which just doesn't hit the same as the original, and much the same for Carol Marcus going from old flame to hot young thing. McCoy makes an eternal life serum out of a tribble, but it will only benefit Kirk once and not be the dawning of the days of unlimited life. This movie is so bad you can't even just let Khan, one of the franchise's best bad guys, be the only antagonist. We had to make Robocop Badmiral another roadblock in the Enterprise's path for very little reason other than some Starfleet on Starfleet action. I think some of this could have worked under a different director, production team, and particularly casting director. But as is, it's just another Trek flop. Capping off an era at number eight must come to an end. Or Nemesis. I can hear the comment section lighting up with questions about how this isn't the worst Trek movie. Well, it has an actual plot that goes start to finish. The bad guy is pretty good despite Tom Hardy beating himself up for years after this one. And it's a decisive finish to the TNG movies, even if it takes a beloved character from us. I think that's the crux of why people don't look at this movie more fondly. But remember, it was at Brent Spiner's request, even though he'd end up giving in every time the studio offered him piles of cash. The second big problem with the movie is the umpteenth time Troy is the victim of a mind assault, even if it is from Mr. War, War never changes himself. 
I otherwise find the plot an extension of TNG more so than the rest of this era of movies. Many are simply over-the-top movie plots that happen to take place in the Trek universe. This actually feels like a natural extension of small screen interactions with the Romulans. The only part that felt forced was the addition of Data's new brother, B4, and the need to play around in a Halo-style warthog just because. I think the biggest problem with the movie overall was putting unproven director Stuart Baird in the big chair. Someone that was an editor first and had no knowledge of Trek was a poor choice for TNG's final outing. All in all, though, I think this is a better film than most give it credit for at least in the grand scheme of Trek cash grabs. Doing some casual time shenanigans at number seven, the one with the whales, or the voyage home. While the last entry ends up on the bottom of many people's lists, here's one that ends up generally on the top, yet we here find it middle of the road. Within these rankings, this movie marks the divergence from the movies that aren't great and have major problems to the ones above that actually work on most levels. When I was younger, I used to feel like this was Trek's best movie. But as an adult, it just feels like something fun that happens. It does a pretty good job wrapping up the three-movie arc started in The Wrath of Khan, but it's also pretty far off the beaten Trek path. It does have an important message that seems to have sunk in about the falling whale population around the world, but it's a bit too happy-go-lucky for me to take truly seriously as a Trek movie, though it does a great job of using its ensemble cast, giving all the main players meaningful stuff to do across the run. The soundtrack, particularly the opening score, is really well done for someone that had never worked with Trek before. A breath of fresh air after two super serious entries to the Trek franchise movies, and a good realignment period for Spock, but ultimately pretty mediocre compared to the films we still have to talk about. Looking for the Fountain of Youth at number 6, Trading Lives, or The Search for Spock. This precursor to The Voyage Home wins a rank higher for Christopher Lloyd as a Klingon alone. The only problem I have with the movie is the super weird pawn far scene between Savick and 14-year-old Spock. That aside, the camaraderie of Spock's friends going to try and retrieve his body at the expense of their own careers is one of the most heartfelt stories in all of Trek. I love that Kirk gets a chance to pull off the Corbomite maneuver one more time even if it does cost him the most iconic ship in the franchise. There's actually something beautiful about watching the old 1701 end its multi-decade trek through the stars. For a son Kirk only met for the first time in the last movie, watching him fall out of his chair as David is unalived, you feel his pain as he hits the floor, and that will play a pivotal role for his character a few films later. I dig the almost Star Wars aesthetic through the movie, like the casual clothes as they take on their empire-like soon-to-be former employers. I even like not Lando Calrissian arresting Bones in the Star Trek cantina. Considering how many movies Christopher Lloyd was involved in at the same time in the mid-80s, his portrayal of Krooge is right up there with the Khans and Gul Dukats of the galaxy. And it's pretty cool John Larroquette remains the last Klingon standing. While the Katra transfer montage is a bit long, Spock's only line about always being Jim's friend is one of the best ending moments of any Trek film. Doing what a focus group said would bring in the most box office dollars at number five, New Beginnings, or Star Trek. Coming off the back of a show that the studio didn't even title Star Trek for the first two seasons, we get the most unoriginal title in the franchise. The whole cash grab thing aside, this is actually a pretty good movie, even if it's in an alternate galaxy far, far away. It's the most original of the Kelvin Timeline movies. I appreciate that it tries to blaze a new trail of its own, even if the subsequent two movies would try to reuse familiar pieces of the Trek puzzle and fail. The recasting is done well and probably better than a few of the main characters in Strange New Worlds. Looking at you, not funny Jim Carrey. While these are slightly alternate versions of those old scientists, it's a great look. 
particularly at Spock's backstory. We finally get a reason for the nickname Bones, and we find out old cars are still a thing being collected in the distant future. I love that we finally get a look at Kirk acing the Kobayashi Maru. While the movie's antagonist Nero is only okay, he does provide a good foil from the Prime Universe to set up this alt universe. While this movie does have some flaws, it's also a good popcorn muncher that I regret missing in theaters. Tearing down the old sets at number four, Passing the Torch. Or Generations. I've seen those of you that don't like this movie and I honestly have no idea why. Not sure if it's the death of Kirk, the fire that ends Jean-Luc's brother and family, or the destruction of the D, but there's a chunk of you that just can't hear. For me, this was the first Trek movie I got to see in the theater, and I still feel about the same today as the first time I caught it on the big screen. The only negative I have here is about the opening credits. I remember thinking it was cool the first time, but it goes on way too long and there's barely a score behind it. Pretty good CGI for the 90s. I really don't understand what's not to like outside of that though. Data gets emotions. We finally get a taste of Guinan's backstory. Malcolm McDowell. And best of all, Klingon Beebs. While I wish the death of Kirk had been alone as he predicted in The Final Frontier, also has never failed to bring a tear to my eye every time I see it. Brent Spiner finally gets a chance to make Data funny and follow up on some of the jokes he didn't get through the run of TNG. And it's generally nice to give him a chance to show his acting range. I really love the fact that this is a dual movie passing the torch from TOS to TNG, and I wish Modern Trek hadn't dropped the ball in this tradition of having at least one person from the previous series to give a send-off. If only Picard had listened to Kirk's advice about promotion beyond Captain, maybe he wouldn't have wasted a couple of decades brooding towards the end of his life, being written in the original Klingon at number three. Soviet Collapse, or The Undiscovered Country. In only David Warner's second best role in Trek, he manages to bring a fresh interpretation of one of Trek's oldest races that's often been an analogy to the collapsing Soviet Union. And in kind, it's rather perfect this plot starts off with a bang that threatens the longevity of the Empire in an analogy to Chernobyl. Sulu in command of the previous maligned Excelsior is a great touch to start this thing off with a bang. It's also great to see Grace Lee Whitney back and find that Rand was able to do more than just be a Yao Min delivering coffee. We get not one, but two amazing classic factors in Chris Plummer and David Warner donning the Klingon ridges and giving top performances. Kirk's entire history with the Klingons comes front and center as he's accused of unaliving Abe Lincoln. We get to see Rurapente and a form of changeling for the first time in Trek. There's probably more small things going on to make up this movie than any other, and I'll be here all day if I try and list off all the interesting scenes that come together nicely to form this film as a whole. But one scene has stuck with many of us, and that's the dinner scene early on in the movie with the blue food and the joke that Shakespeare was actually Klingon. After the lackluster fifth movie in the series, this is absolutely the best send-off we could have hoped for the original cast, and even signing their names in the credits cements that. Getting older at number two, bad at maintaining, or The Wrath of Khan. Somehow, Trek's cheapest to make movie is still the best for the TOS cast 40 years later. Speaking of the passage of time, that's one of the major themes as we finally acknowledge the aging of the actors after the motion picture. This is the only Trek movie to be a direct sequel to a previous episode, Space Sea. Bringing back Ricardo Montalban and his chest were a heck of a good decision. If this movie had never been made, I think Khan would have been a largely forgettable villain based on that single TOS episode. But through this, goes on to be maybe the most prolific villain in Trek history that's been brought up in many episodes and a craptacular reboot movie. 
The other major iconic thing that might have come back around too often in modern Trek that's introduced in this movie is the Kobayashi Maru. I love the idea of a no-win scenario test, though perhaps the most iconic moment of the movie is Kurt screaming, <laughs> Considering how small the budget was, the space battles in this one are probably the best Trek saw for decades to come, and still one of the best in sci-fi history in general. Though, I still have to wonder why Scotty brought a dying cadet to the bridge rather than sickbay. Khan quoting classic literature throughout the movie is definitely another high point. While I'm never a big fan of killing off characters just to bring them back later, Spock's journey does work on a narrative level and never fails to bring a tear to my eye during the send-off scene. If The Wrath of Khan were a song, it'd be a real earworm. Taking the top spot at number one, Swedish shenanigans, or First Contact. The next-gen cast did get one great movie, and I'd even say the greatest. With the debut of the Sovereign Class Enterprise E, we find the cast from the D pretty much where we left off. Well, except for Worf, who will catch up with Captaining the Defiant a long way from DS9, helping stop another Borg cube headed for Earth. Only after Picard disobeys orders and brings the Enterprise to the second battle of Sector 001, is the cube destroyed with his first-hand knowledge. But this sets in motion time shenanigans that puts the remaining Borg and the crew of the E in the 2060s, just ahead of humans' first warp flight in post-World War II Montana, bringing back James Cromwell as a drunk AF Zephram Cochran is probably the best choice for the role of the man that invented warp drive. Another great casting decision is Alice Kriege as the first iteration of the Borg Queen. None of the queens that have come since have had the same charisma, though the late Annie Wershing came close. I'm really glad Voyager was able to get her back in their final episode. Speaking of Voy, we get cameos by both the Doctor and Ethan Phillips, and I love how Bob Picardo tries to delay the Borg with calm medical dialogue. Picard gets to go a little unhinged, which is out of character for him, but gets rightly called out as Captain Ahab a couple of years ahead of him actually playing that character in a made-for-TV Moby Dick. The only thing that bothers me is that at the end of the movie, we never see them going back to the future or utilizing this time travel method again since it's so easy to recreate, especially without a deflector dish. But getting to see First Contact with the Vulcans is a huge moment in the Trek universe, and I'm glad it got a whole movie to lead up to this major moment. Another major moment that's movie-worthy is emotional data seriously considering whether the Borg are his real family. After all the build-up through TNG about his search for humanity, his moments with the Queen really hit. And, I mean, any movie that gets Dwight Schultz a cameo deserves a top spot. Computer, that program is available. Thanks, Major. Thanks, Major. Thanks, Major. Thanks, Major. Mr. Spock. Major. Major. Osmotic micro pump, right here. Thanks, Major. I remember Lieutenant Ilea once mentioning she wore that. Thanks, Major. Major. Now scanning Pond's area. Thanks, Major. Dalfi Ling, 5 cc's. Thanks, Major. We need that power to keep the medical and emergency facilities functioning. Thanks, Major. Starship separation in 5 minutes. Thanks, Major. Major. Starship separation. Online. Thanks, Major. Warning. Decompression in 45 seconds. Thanks, Major. Major. 
self-destruct in 15 minutes. There will be no further audio warning. Thanks, Major. Auto-destruct sequence deactivated. Thanks, Major. Major. Specify. Thanks, Major. Auto-destruct is offline. Thanks, Major. Authorization not recognized. Thanks, Major. Major. If you've enjoyed the content, please consider a like and subscribe. Join me and other Trek tubers most Sundays at 2 p.m. Eastern for our live stream Buffer Time, where we talk the latest episodes and deep dive into Trek topics. Until I see you again, live long and prosper. No.